first of all, um, thank you for attending this session on dormant assets. Um, I realise we've made a bit of a mistake. We don't have any Kleenex on the uh, on the table, so when you dry your eyes, try and use a bit of your your shirt or your or your jacket or jumper or dress that that you uh, you won't want to be seen. Um, I recognise a number of faces within this room, both from our issuer clients and from our relationship team. I've been talking about this subject on and off for about, about six years. Um, but we're really now getting to the stage where we're, we're, we're at the, kind of the business end of launching. And I'm very, very pleased to have with me today um, Adrian Smith and Helen Boyd from the Reclaim Fund. Um, now, the Reclaim Fund will give you lots of information as to, as to what it is, but essentially they're the, uh, the fund that holds on, to, or the, the, the monies get transferred into, they hold on to, and then they allocate the funds out to the, the, the good causes and the beneficiaries um, at the end of it. So we'll hear mo much more about that in the presentation today. By way of background, the Dormant Asset Scheme has been running since about 2011 in the banking building sector, and in 2020, the government, um, they, they showed their support and they confirmed their support for a, an industry blueprint, which was going to expand the scheme into um, the financial services sector. And mentioned that we're really at the business end now. So what we're going to do with this session is try to bring that to life. What does part participation actually look like? What does it feel like? How would you go about participating? But we'll also see through here what the Reclaim Fund role is, um, we'll see some of the beneficiaries, uh, we'll hear some stories. They've got some very, very good stories, some videos about some of the, um, the beneficiaries as well. So we're going to take questions throughout the session as well, should you have them, but we're also going to try and allow about 10 minutes after the session for a bit of Q&A. Um, so given that we're, we're 45 minutes for the session, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Adrian, who will just give you a, a First of all, introduce himself and also be able to talk to you about the, uh, the scheme itself. Lovely. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, well, mo uh, good morning, everybody. It is morning. Um, thank you, and thank you for setting the expectation. Um, there may be tears. There are, there are two videos to give you a clue. The second video is the tearjerker. The first video is not meant to make you cry, but if you do, then you know, the second one definitely will. Um, I'm Adrian Smith. As Steve said, I'm the chief executive of Reclaim Fund, have been for a number of years, uh, in fact, since inception of the Dormant Asset Scheme back in 2011, and Helen Boyd is our Chief Operating Officer. We'll do a bit of a double act, and we'll take you through a sort of whistle-stop tour of the Dormant Asset Scheme, and we will leave some time at the end uh, for you to, take to ask uh, some questions. I, I kind of describe the Dormant Asset Scheme as being financial services' best-kept secret. Um, it's a voluntary scheme. It's been around for uh, 13 years now. And it's, you'll see later some of the numbers that are floating around in the system, and it really is doing some amazing things. And your sector within listed companies has an opportunity now to join the scheme because of legislation that we'll, we'll talk about. So I'm just going to start by bringing the scheme to life by just showing you a very short video, and then I'll take you through some of the background of the scheme, and then Helen and I will sort of work between us to sort of bring it to life and, and hopefully demonstrate to you how it's relevant uh, to the sector that you represent. So participating in the scheme and being first to join the expanded scheme absolutely aligns with Aviva's social purpose and values. You know, it's a nice solution really. You know, you, you've got a problem in dormant assets and this is how to how to use them for good. Nationwide has been part of the dormant asset scheme since it was first incepted. So dormant assets scheme is a really good fit with nationwide's purpose and values because of the fact that it's focused first and foremost on supporting existing members and reunifying as many as possible. But secondly, because Nationwide is a building society, so the support that we're able to then provide through the scheme um, to good causes and society as a whole is really important. 
We utilise the dormant assets funding that comes through the Reclaim Fund to mean that we can actually support really grassroots youth organisations. Dormant assets is otherwise just sitting there doing nothing and this way the money is finding its way to the places that can really benefit. For our business, dormant assets have meant the world. Um, and I'm just, I'm not even exaggerating there. I've been given a voice and I'm using my voice and I'm not scared to be empowered and just be. Thank you. Well, I'm not seeing any tears, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite reassured by that. Um, I'm going to use some notes, apologies, because I've got no uh, slides in front of me, so they're just a, a copy of the slides. But I'm going to start by just touching on what a dormant asset is, and I think it's, it's pretty important in, in this sector. So going back to the start when the scheme was established, it only applied to bank and building society accounts, and they have a fairly simple definition. They, they're basically an account that's 15 years or older, uh, that hasn't had any customer-initiated transactions on it, becomes dormant. And when that account becomes dormant, um, it's eligible to transfer into the dormant assets scheme. Moving forward, the scheme is expanding, as we'll touch on later, into new asset classes, but they all have slightly different sort of terms of reference in terms of, uh, of how they're structured. So in the sector that you represent, um, it'll basically be uh, accounts or, or shares and share proceeds um, that haven't been touched for 12 years. So it is slightly different, so you have a 12-year period. Um, but in essence, other than that, the, the time scale, the principles are the same. So the principles are that these shares, these dividends, these proceeds, bank accounts, insurance policies, etc., a whole spectrum of, of products across financial services, um, are untouched by customers. The customer has lost touch with them, and therefore they become eligible for the scheme. And we'll talk later about the fact that you can always get the money back. So there's a reclaim right in perpetuity, uh, which makes the scheme uh, pretty unique. Um, in terms of uh, banks, just to bring this to life, we'll talk about some of the numbers. But the average bank account that we hold is about £85. So when people talk about dormant assets, sometimes they think about these huge amounts of money, the sort of the £100,000 million pound pots. They're the ones that grab the headlines. But the harsh reality is they're about £85. And so you can see why there would be very you know, reasonable expectations that people do lose touch with small amounts of money that are perhaps in passbooks or, in your case, you know, share certificates, small holdings, dividends that are unclean. So um, it's the power of bringing all those together that makes the Dormant Asset Scheme um, a success. In terms of uh, what is the Dormant Asset Scheme, well, quite simply, the scheme is a government-led initiative back in uh, 2008. Um, it took about two and a half, three years to bring it to life. Uh, the scheme is enabled via uh, a parliamentary act, which was originally called the catchy name of the Dormant Bank and Building Society Accounts Act 2008. Thankfully, it's been updated to just become the Dormant Assets Act. And the reason it's been updated is to incorporate all the assets that I referred to. So we've now moved into uh, effectively three new sectors. Insurance and pensions, where we've started work, and you saw from Kirsty Cooper on the video at Aviva that we now have some insurance assets. We also do now have some pension assets um, from a firm who've just joined. And then we have two sectors left to expand into. The first is uh, investments and wealth management, um, which covers uh, clearly, clearly investment products. Um, so firms like JP Morgan and Jupiter and BlackRock, um, et cetera. And then shares in UK public listed companies, which is called the securities sector. But I, I personally don't necessarily think it's labeled correctly. I think it really is um, listed companies. And, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that. So we've had uh, 40 uh, participant organisations. We'll, we'll bring some of the numbers to life. Some of them were in the video uh, who've joined the scheme. Banks and building societies are still joining. When we started the scheme, ESG didn't exist. You just about had CSR in, in, in place. Um, but with ESG, we think the scheme um, you know, is a massive contributor to a firm's ability to be able to, uh, to work on their, their ESG objectives. And then quite simply, um, our aim is to be able to unlock all of this money and distribute as much as we possibly can a surplus to good causes. So it's a very simple scheme in the sense that money comes into us, we look after it, we invest it very carefully, we give away 
was an agreed modelled surplus to good causes, and the impact of that you'll see as we go through this. Um, but crucially, there is a reclaim right in perpetuity, uh, and that exists across the sector, um, and firms act as our agents. So we're, we're not a, a customer or a B2C facing organisation. We work with you, we work with banks, we basically look after the money, and if the customers come forward, uh, identify themselves, the money is given uh, straight back to them. So I'm going to ask Steve just to sort of link that in terms of some of the principles of the Dormant Asset Scheme in respect of, of the sector that, that we represent here. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. <coughs> um, I mentioned that I've been working on this project for a number of years now. It's been um, in inception. We're working through some of the finer detail. Uh, myself, Adrian, Helen, we sit on the, the expansion board. So it's quite easy for us to just forget that there are some core principles and the simplicity um, that Adrian's spoken about, about how the, the, the money is used. And we also realise that it's not necessarily information that's been able to, to, to get out. Because whilst we had the initial or the original blueprint, it's very much been a lot of trying to work our way through some of the challenges in order to launch into the sectors that we've been working on during this time period. So it's worth going back to the three principles and how this dormant asset scheme tries to differentiate itself from, for example, a share forfeiture programme. And I'm sure you'll all be very familiar with share forfeiture programmes that you currently undertake um, because it's very similar in terms of the upfront steps. Um, the first principle... Um, is absolutely um, reunification first. So the Reclaim Fund, um, they, once they've received the money, it's money's transferred into the accounts that they administer, they look after. Uh, once it's transferred out, um, the Reclaim Fund still maintains that liability, still, still has that liability. It's transferred into the Reclaim Fund and away from, from the issuer. Now, what it means is that they really want the cleanest money that they can possibly get their hands on. So having a good um, track trace verification program in place is absolutely the first place that, that you need to start. Um, this is a very well-travelled route within our sector. Um, I think it's something we've discussed at length, that there's, there's a lot of um, analysis available. Um, all of the registrars can look at the data, they can look at the underlying data, they can see gone aways, they can see dormant assets and so on. And then we all um, there's also services that can, can start the tracing exercise. One of the things that I know that we're, we're currently looking at is how can we improve the hit rates? Now, is there other data sets that we can get hold of? This is, as, as Adrian mentioned, it's a government-led um, scheme. It's a government-sponsored scheme. So is there other elements of data that hopefully we can improve some hit rates, which would also be beneficial to the sector in itself anyway to just get ad additional hit rates to make sure that we can have better governed registers? The second principle is voluntary participation. In some of the conversations that I've been having with a number of people in this room, I've always had the question put to me, is it ever going to become mandatory? I don't think so. I don't think it has in the 13 years that it's been um, up and running to date. I don't think there's ever going to be anyone who wants to try to make this mandatory. There are enough good reasons that you will see as we walk through this presentation um, to consider this as something that you would potentially want to participate in and then it's just a case of understanding exactly what participation looks and feels like and hopefully you'll get a bit of that as well when we run through some of the, the organizations who have who have already joined um, the, the, the new expanded sector as well and the third one and the real differentiator is that um, the right of reclaim is in perpetuity it's always going to be there no matter how long um, the, the the time frame is between the the money's being first of all gone away, then moving to a dormant pot, and then being transferred into the reclaim fund, even if that's 30, 50, 70 years online, it's always available, always there. And that goes back to the risk that the reclaim fund have as well, which is why they want some clean, clean money within there. But I thought it would just be worthwhile really teasing out all of those core principles just to make sure that everyone is aware. Thank you, Steve. That's, uh, th that's great. And uh, it's great to bring this scheme to life for, for you uh, and, and the sector that you represent. So a little bit more about the Reclaim Fund, and we are the operator of the Dormant Asset Scheme. Uh, we've done so since 2011, when the scheme was first founded, and Adrian was the CEO at that point, and he remains the CEO now. Uh, so we've got great continuity. We're a regulated entity. We're regulated by the FCA. And we are an arm's length government body. It wasn't the case originally, but um, we are now an arm's length government body um, and our shareholder is HM Treasury. Because we're an arm's length body, 
um, our um, liabilities, if you like, are ultimately backed by government. So if we were ever in a position, which there is zero likelihood that we'd be in a position where we would not be able to cover future reclaims, then ultimately we're backed by HM Treasury. So the consumer, the shareholder, you know, has the best possible protection that they possibly can have. Uh, we have a team based in Crewe, uh, an operations centre there, and um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very well-established, very vibrant business now um, with, with some people who are incredibly passionate and loyal uh, to this organisation and all the, thi all the things that we do. So why participate in the scheme? And uh, Steve's given a couple of reasons already. And you can see the quotes here by the two people that you saw in the video. Um, the reason we picked these two people is not only because they're existing participants in the scheme, but they are two of our industry champions. We have an industry champion for each of the eligible sectors for the scheme. So Kirsty Cooper um, there, who is, as you can see, is a group, group company secretary and general counsel at Aviva, is our industry champion for this sector, Fit For You, and we'll give you her contact details later because she's delighted to speak to companies that are keen to, to join the scheme. Um, and um, Tom Riley, who is the um, uh, industry champion uh, for the banks and building society sector. So he's the longest standing uh, industry champion that, that we have. So the reasons that people join the scheme are, are, are manifold, really. So the first thing is it is good for consumers. So uh, if you think about your shareholders, a lot of them will have you know one or two share certificates, probably not worth a huge amount of money, but it is still an asset to them. And it's great that we can make sure that they continue to have that right in perpetuity to reclaim that money. Um, it's good for society because of what we do to, you know, with that money that, that has been brought into the scheme. And it's really good for you as organisations who choose to participate as well. It's a very clear expression of your ESG commitments, which we know is increasingly important from a, a sort of a, a reputational perspective. Um, and it, it's a way you're saying to your, you know, your, your shareholders, you know, we are here to make sure that we look after your interests in perpetuity, but the money that we just cannot re reunite with shareholders, uh, all the proceeds, you know, dividends and other forms of proceeds, we're making sure that it's, making, it's, it, it's being used for the best possible purpose. So how does it work in practice? Um, I, I would wave my arms around a bit and point at things, but I'll fall down the stage. So I'll, I'll just... <laughs> I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll work out where I'm, where I'm talking about. So I'm going to start with the industry participants. So that is you as, as a company that decides to participate in the scheme. You sign a transfer and agency agreement with us, and that's just the contract that governs our, our relationship, which we hope is a, is a long-term relationship, and that, that's certainly the case that we've had with all of our existing participants. You sign that agreement, and uh, on an annual basis or a one-off basis or however often is appropriate for you, you then transfer the value of your, your uh, dormant shares um, to us, and having gone through that uh, tracing and reunification process that, that Steve had already mentioned. In the event that someone comes to you and says, oh, I, fa I found my, my granny's share certificate, you know, it's from 1976, you know, is it worth anything? You pay them, that you say to them, yes, actually, you pay that money back, and you go through a, a, a reclaim process with us, normally on a quarterly basis. Um, or as often as, you know, if you don't have any in a quarter, then you just do it the next time. So it's, it's a process that you're not having to wait for that annual transfer process. You do that on a quarterly process. Um, so we hold that money to make sure we can fund those reclaims, but there is a surplus, a substantial surplus that we don't need to cover those reclaims. We transfer that um, to the National Lottery Community Fund, which is over on the right-hand side, and they then fund those social and community initiatives across all four uh, nations of the UK. And there's slightly different mechanisms for each of those cu countries, as I'll talk about in a moment. So you saw some of the numbers on that initial presentation or the initial video, but just to give you a bit of a reminder, so far we've had 1.7 billion has transferred into the scheme, um, of which we've transferred over 900 million now to good causes via the National Lottery Community Fund. There is still an active reclaim process. As Steve mentioned, it's important to go through that TVR process, or we call it TVR for tracing, verification, and reunification. Reunification, it's a very difficult word to say. Um, 
But there's been about 132 million so far in customer reclaims, and that's why we hold that money back so that we can make sure we fund that, we can fund that in future. But using that money, that um, it's, it's now 982 million, actually it's gone to good causes, then uh, we've ind indirectly, via the National Lottery Community Fund, um, supported around 2,500 different initiatives. So as we expand the scheme... Oh, sorry, you've got a question. My apologies. No, no, no. I just did the math. So yeah. What happens to the other 600 million? So we, um, as I mentioned, that it's, a, it's a very good question. So I mentioned that we are regulated by the FCA. So we have a, a, a requirement to hold a certain proportion of funds um, to cover future reclaims. It is more than that reclaim requirement, actually, as, as you'll see by that 132 million, but it is a perpetual right of reclaim. So just because we fund, we've paid this amount back in reclaims so far, we don't know what that future liability is, got to, is going to be, so we continue to support that. However, we, do, you know, we are investing that money, and there are certain times where, in fact, quite regularly, there are times when we have surplus funds, perhaps from int um, interest income, for example, uh, or we just you know, th that is spare that gets filtered to good causes as well. So uh, we're a non-for-profit uh, organisation. So uh, we cover our costs from the interest income, but the remainder also gets um, gets um, transferred to good causes as well. But it's a very good question. And, uh, I hope you don't mind Not at all. Can we get a mic, Tara? Does that mean you work with banking partners? We partners? have an investment banking relationship, yes, to help us with that investment process. Okay. Mark's got a question at the back. You don't want to share who that is? Uh, we work with Goldman Sachs. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, you mentioned people would be able to claim their funds back. Yes. As the funds crystallise, are you putting people back into the position before because if we're selling shares yeah uh, the value of shares could go up and they would have claimed dividends as well so is it crystallized or are we really putting people back in the position if they come to light the principle of the scheme and, and steve you can correct me if i'm wrong on the mechanics of, of this particular sector because it is slightly di slightly different across sectors in terms of how that uh, restitution is is done but the concept of the scheme is that a person will be in exactly the same position as if that share had never been transferred into the scheme. So they should not, uh, their financial position should not um, be, uh, should not suffer at all as a result of, of that, be that share uh, becoming dormant. Do you want to clarify that? Uh, I will. Um, I mentioned that this has been a bit of an ongoing project. There's been lots of challenges and hurdles and discussions with regulators and government and so on. The security sector was deemed from the very beginning to be slightly different, slightly nuanced from some of the other sectors um, because of the fact that a, a share um, has a lot of rights attached to it. The values can go up and down. Uh, you could also get dividend payments, you get corporate actions, etc., etc. So the security sector is the one sector where at the point of um, crystallization, of the shares which have been um, identified as dormant. Once they're crystallized, they're sold in the marketplace and the monies are transferred into the reclaim fund, it's that value that is, is to be reclaimed. It's the value that was transferred at the point of crystallization. It isn't any ongoing share, uh, uh, share value movements or, or um, share entitlement movements. It's, at the, it's, it's slightly yeah. different to the other sectors yeah, because no of the nature of the, of the security itself as opposed to some of the other investments, which are just straight cash. So, sorry, can I just pick up on that? So if someone, someone's share was transferred into the fund, sorry, if a person's <coughs> share was transferred into the fund and at that time it was worth £10 or whatever, but they come back 20 years later and those shares are now worth £50 each, they won't get the value of the shares. They'd only get the value that it was worth at the time it was transferred. That's correct. Okay. I mean, I, I can probably build slightly by saying it's... In some ways, it's similar to a share forfeiture program now. With a share forfeiture program, the firm elects to have that forfeiture program and the customer doesn't have any rights. The, the, the key issue here is that as a firm, you can participate in the scheme and whilst the share or the proceeds are crystallised, that money is sent to us. The liability for your firm is extinguished. We have the in perpetuity liability for that amount. Um, so it is different in the sense that if a, if a customer who'd been part of a share forfeiture program comes forward, 
you haven't got any money because you've given it away. So you have to decide whether you're going to fund the customer from your own uh, funds. Whereas if you use the dormant asset scheme, you can fund it. As, as Helen said, it's slightly different in banks because with banks, of course, um, there are, there are no, there's no volatility in the price of a savings account other than interest. So we, do, we pay a, a small amount of interest. Um, but in, in shares, as Steve said, it's been quite a debate. Um, but the, the government settled on share forfeiture uh, on, on this scheme um, being crystallised to cash and then the cash coming across and the cash going back. And does an issuer need um, uh, anything in their articles to be able to, to do this? Do you need to change your articles of association? It's a, it's a great question. We'll come to it. What I'd okay. probably ask to do is if we can run the next... We've only got a few more slides left. If we run them, then we will take some questions at the end because we will cover, I think, a couple of the questions that you'll ask. Yeah. Mm. So the, the point about articles is, is absolutely in, in the next couple. Is yeah. that OK? Thanks. No, thank you. So we mentioned that we're going through scheme expansion at the moment into uh, your sector. I know it's not one single sector, but, but to expand into do dormant shares and proceeds. Um, we're also doing the same with insurance and pensions. And as you'll see here, these are the first two participants in the insurance and pension sector, Aviva and uh, Legal and General. Um, and we know that what's we're finding great about some of these new companies that are expressing an interest is that they are looking to participate across multiple sectors, not just in these cases for insurance and pensions, but also for dormant shares as well, so that they are sort of expanding their uh, participation across all of the different dormant assets that they hold. Um, we've had some fantastic support for this um, expansion process. As you can see, we've got you know some great government um, um, support through uh, our Minister for Civil Society and uh, Ec Economic Secretary to the Treasury and others. And um, uh, um, Stuart Andrew, who's the Minister of Civil Society, will be speaking at our event on the 28th of November, which we'll uh, mention right at the end as well, because that would be a great opportunity for perhaps for some of you to find out a little bit about more about the scheme and its participants. And, and Helen, just on that, I think it's worth saying that this is one of the government-sponsored projects which has cross-party support. Yep. There's absolutely no doubt that, that this is something that, that whoever is in government will be a, a keen supporter of. Thank you. That's, a that's definitely worth clarifying. So who benefits from the scheme and how? So I mentioned that um, funds are transferred to the National Lottery Community Fund. Um, in the devolved administrations, then that money is then distributed directly from the National Lottery Community Fund. <laughs> In England, it's transferred through four spend organisations, which are overseen together by the Oversight Trust. So those four organisations uh, do certain things. So uh, the, the three key um, financial, sorry, the key, three key uh, spend priorities are financial inclusion, social investment and youth, and particularly youth employability. So uh, you see the four organisations here. Big Society Capital was the first organisation that received Dormant Assets funding. Um, and then Access, found it at the Foundation for Social Investment. Both of those obviously provide social investment. Youth Futures Foundation, which, as the name implies, uh, covers the youth um, portfolio. And Fair for All Finance. Fair for All Finance and Youth Futures are the two newest organisations, first set up in 2019. But both of those are now, um, there's a ramping up of monies going to those organisations. Uh, the government recently issued uh, a, a, um, a, an announcement to say that over the next four years, those three causes, um, plus uh, one other sort of new development that's ongoing at the moment, uh, will receive equal funding. So as you can see, social investment up until now um, has received somewhat more money than those other causes, but that will be uh, rebalanced uh, in future years. So we gave you a little bit of an example earlier on of the type of organisation that's receiving dormant assets funding today. So we wanted to feature one uh, organisation, the Merseyside Youth, Organ Youth Association, uh, which is very close to our heart. We have a number of people in our team from Liverpool, uh, where, it, where the uh, Merseyside Youth Association is based. Um, and indeed, one of our employees is actually volunteering now because they uh, really see the value of that work. So just to give you a little... I'm Barry Fletcher. I'm the CEO of Youth Futures Foundation. 
We utilize the dormant assets funding that comes through the Reclaim Fund to mean that we can actually support really grassroots youth organizations. We're doing that in Merseyside through the Merseyside Youth Association and they are using that funding to make a real difference to young people with complex challenges. Merseyside Youth Association is a youth work charity. We work with children and young people across Liverpool City region. Talent Match is our employability programme, which is funded through Youth Futures Foundation. We do step-by-step -step action planning with them. We get them to look at their assets, so what they're really good at, and we build on that, and we build their confidence and their skills. Before Talent Match, I was in a really low place, and just like, the amount of confidence I've gained. I didn't have any qualifications, didn't have much going for me before I came here. You know, came here, helped me out, got me qualifications, got a job, I'm doing so now. It has never been more important to invest in our young people so this generation isn't lost. With the right support, they can absolutely fly, but it is key that we are here to do that work with and alongside them. We know that if we could reach the same level as Germany in terms of youth employment, that would improve the economy by 38 billion uh, in terms of our GDP a year. Now that's not only a huge prize for UK PLC, but there's a huge number of young people whose lives will be made better through being able to move into work as early as possible. The methods that Mayside Youth Association use and Talent Match, it's just, it's so different from other youth services. It just works. It's young person led, they cater it to individuals needs. It's so on point. We're going to take our learning that we get from the work we've done with NYA and look to share that, not just in that place, but across the places we are funding through Connected Futures, which is eight places across England. And we're hoping to expand that to some new places in the future. Dormant Assets has been absolutely crucial. We received 90 million initially and another 20 million uh, last year to support our work. And that's allowed us to think long term. There's nothing more fulfilling than actually seeing young people's lives changing in front of you um, and knowing that without that intervention things could have been really, really different. Come anytime, it's the best year. And save people's lives, like, I, if I was still doing what I, what I used to be doing. Uh, it's like insurance for like, young people's lives, you know what I mean? I've been given a voice and I'm using my voice and I'm not scared to be empowered and just be. Brilliant. Thank you, Helen. Um, I'm going to canter through a couple of sort of slides just to finish off because I am conscious there are some questions coming, which is fantastic. So we'd like some time for those. Um, before I do that, I just want to come back to one question from the front. We talked about the investment portfolio. Just a bit of clarity, we, whilst we do invest with, so Goldman Sachs are our investment manager, the first thing to say is that we have an incredibly low risk appetite, so our role is not to try and grow this fund. Our, our, our role is to safeguard the fund and always have enough money to give back. And alongside Goldman Sachs, as a government body, we also um, have the luxury of being able to bank with the Bank of England. So we also have a, uh, an, an account with Bank of England that pays base rates. So um, that's a very important tool um, in us being able to safeguard the fund. So very quickly, just to bring to life sort of the, the 900 million pounds that we talked about, which is fast approaching a billion pounds of distribution to, to causes like you saw in the video, which you know, we think is, is hugely powerful. The 2023 distribution that we're just making, um, it, we made in March, 45 million pounds of that on the right hand side is going to financial inclusion. And I think for both the, your sector and the other sectors I've mentioned, I think financial inclusion is a really important part of what you do. I think um, all of us know that we would like younger people to grow up being far more financially literate and far more financially aware. Um, and so I think a lot of the industry champions and, and Steve and colleagues are very keen that funding moves in that direction. So you can see a big amount of our latest distribution has gone in that direction. Um, we'll skip over that because there was a, a, another video, but we, we won't show it because uh, I want to do some questions. So in terms of uh, participation in the scheme, we will, we're not open to your sector yet. Um, we will be very soon. I want to pay tribute to Steve. Steve's been working with us now for a long period of time 
literally years um, and has represented your sector and has obviously represented as well the registrars and has helped us walk through a number of issues. He helped with the legislation. And I know that with Kirsty coming on board as the industry champion, um, we will get over the line. So we will soon be in a position to present to you um, the proposition. And a question that came up earlier about adjoining articles, yes, there will be, there will be a need to uh, amend articles. And we can touch on it during the, during the questions. Um, but we have developed a, a template uh, with basically the Department of Business and Trade. So that template has been developed. Um, it's been looked at by council and it's ready to go. So we can effectively sort of bring you a transfer and agency agreement and some adjoining articles in a box in terms of a, a, of a solution for you to consider. Um, so I guess the, the, the big request in some ways for us is if you are interested in joining the scheme is to start to think about reunification, um, is to start to sort of segment dormant assets uh, and start to think about some of the activities that Steve talked about earlier in terms of tracing them. And then in terms of what could come from this sector, so about three years ago, government asked your sector, um, you had a different industry champion in place, some of you know, may know Robert Welsh, who's the co-sec at Tesco, he was the industry champion at the time. There was a bottom-up analysis of what this sector could deliver uh, to the overall scheme, and you can see the numbers on there moving across to the uh, the right-hand side, where there's a potential £66 million. Personally, I think that's an underestimate. Um, when we started the bank scheme, the banks told us that there was £400 million in dormant assets across banks and building societies. And as you can already see, that's, that's probably you know, fast approaching £2 billion. So I, I think it's an underestimate, but um, those are the numbers that we have. Um, so I'll just conclude. Again, I, I, I've already thanked Steve, but I want to thank Steve again for, for inviting us to be part of this. And... You know, he's clearly around for you to talk to, as indeed we are. Um, we do have an event on the 28th of November where we will be getting some of the organisations that you've seen present actually coming and telling their own stories. And um, that genuinely is a, a, a tearjerker. We, have, we, we get people who we fund to come down from all parts of the UK um, to tell us how Dormant Assets uh, has changed their lives. So people would be very welcome to come to that and we can let you have details of, of that event. So I just conclude really on behalf of Helen and I by saying thank you um, for allowing us to talk about dormant assets uh, in the time that we have left, Steve, which is pretty minimal, but probably um, 10 minutes tops. We, we can happily take some questions and have some dialogue about dormant assets. So thanks again for listening and uh, happy to take your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Adrian. So if anyone does have any questions, there's one at the back over there. <coughs> Uh, thanks very much. It's Ray Cahill from ABF. Um, uh, just a quick one, uh, generally about these schemes, that there'll always be a beneficiary somewhere unless uh, ultimately the Crown has waived all its rights, because normally it would go to the, the Crown if you can't have any. Is that, uh, is that built into these schemes, that, that you won't get a claim from? Like if, you, if someone doesn't have any dependents uh, and dies intestate, that would normally go to the Crown, so there'll, there'll be that. Is that written into the legislation on this? Or is the risk that at some point King Charles will ask for his money back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're, you're talking about uh, Bonavacantia, I yeah. guess, in terms of the, the concept. So if, if, a, if, a, if an heir does come forward, um, then an heir is obviously dealt with in the same way. I, in terms of um, estates that are unclaimed, then this doesn't form part of that because there is no customer relationship. So there is no way of actually being able to relate this money to anybody. So un unlike, so, so Bonavacantia tend, uh, tends to work in the, on the basis that if there is no um, legitimate heir to the money, yeah. um, the money can get passed to the Crown uh, absolutely through that process. Um, in this instance, the, the customer is, is lost. So there may be a customer record, but that customer record doesn't have any address and doesn't have any relationship. So... Um, we, we don't see, I mean, we are, we are um, subject to that in terms of people coming forward, anybody coming forward with a legitimate claim. Um, but you'll see from some of the share forfeiture programs and some of the bank and bill society accounts we have, typically the customer is just simply gone mm. and lost and can never be connected. So to, to bring it to life very quickly, some of the money we have um, has arguably, you know, it's, it's, they, they've lost the address. But we have, a lot, we have a huge amount of money in the bank and building society sector where, frankly, the bank has just got a lot of money that they know is customer money, 
but they have no customer record to be able to relate it to. Yeah. So and in that case, there's no way that that could be related back to, to an individual customer. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah, in the middle there. Hi, I've just got a quick question about um, if an issuer has a, a, um, a shareholder come to them for their their cash asset as it is by then, are there any prescriptions around administration fees for dealing with the return of people's cash? And is it just something that is taken by each, com each company? Um, but and then again, if they then claim that from the reclaim fund, are there any administration fees? included in that process. Do you want me to take? Well, you start on an I'll yeah. come in from an RFL. So um, participation within the scheme, and this is cross-sector, um, you'll sign up to transfer and agency agreements, you'll become a participant, and you will be building your own infrastructure to be able to, um, to, be able to make the deposits in and the, the transfers out. In our sector, with the role of a registrar, we currently perform these this, this analysis. We look at the gonaways, the dormancies, and so on. So clearly, there is a a, um, a cost of doing the, the of the delivery of the service, um, and there is the ability within the scheme to um, to to f for those for that administrative burden to be to be satisfied through through the funds as well. It's a case of how do we make it as efficient as possible to keep the cost down as low as possible. And that's what we're currently working through in terms of the transfer agency agreement, the, the tracing and verification um, processes. But it's a case of, I mentioned earlier about getting additional support. So if we can get additional data, we can make, get additional hits and so on. There's other elements within the, the entire financial services sector that we are considering within the expansion board as to how we can make this 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 a lot um, a lot slicker and a lot easier and I think that's where the reduction in costs is really going to be, be critical to make it a, a very very simple to, to make these reclaims I mean I, I just add and say we don't we don't have fees so we don't charge fees um, the, the money that comes to us gets goes back to you our costs are defrayed from as, as Helen said from interest income they're allowed to be defrayed from capital so in the event that the interest rates were back down at sort of zero or, or half percent again, and we weren't making money, we can operate the scheme from capital, but we never have. So all the way through 12 years, we've always funded the business through interest income. Um, and that stays. I mean, th there is a cost of entry for firms on the basis that you have to get your record straight and there's some administration and there's some processes. But once those are in play, um, and the other thing we've done is we've, we've got a standard transfer and agency agreement, which we don't negotiate. So it's negotiated on behalf of the sector, and then it's commoditized. So it's kind of a voluntary scheme. If you want to join, you can, but we don't get into causing you lots of legal cost of, of joining. Thank you. I can see three questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, just in terms of share forfeiture, which you have talked about, do you think, it's probably more directed at you, Steve, there's going to be a shift in companies moving away from share forfeiture to move into the reclaim fund area and is that a controversial I think is shift? The, I think is the right question. Um, the way that I see this is currently lots of companies have got a very specific governance program as to how they deal with forfeited monies and the charitable causes that they can work with. Um, what will an issuer needs to do in order to understand whether participation in this scheme is right for them. Agents already said, well, I think it was Helen actually, you, you spoke about packaging up and making entry as simple as possible. That's something that's being worked on but needs to be delivered. That would contain articles of association changes. Um, what is the minimum level? Is there a de minimis level for the, the, re, uh, the, the track trace and verification? Um, participation itself. It's a standard agreement, getting that signed off often it can be quite quite challenging as well. But I don't want to look at all this as, as, as challenges. These are, th these are things that would have to be considered in the round as to why is participation in this scheme better and why should I go to my board and recommend to them 
that we go in to the, the dormant asset scheme as opposed to any of the share forfeiture programs and the, the well-governed charitable organisations that we currently, currently um, uh, fund. Now, this is where I think understanding who the beneficiaries are, understanding the way the, the Reclaim Fund operate, understanding the, 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 uh, the participation terms and conditions is really going to be critical for everybody in this room um, to be able to make that decision and to make that recommendation. I think what you will see as you move further down the track within the security sector or the expanded sectors at the moment, we've only got two participants. When we get to the position where we've got 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 participants, it may be very different. You may have some NEDs on your board who are, uh, who are participants with other um, organisations that they're with, or you may just see a very much stronger ESG message coming out of, of, um, uh, of the, the dormant asset scheme if it's government sponsored for example they you know i know that you're potentially talking about um having a, a again a, st a standard template which is which is a very very strong esg message um quite a long answer but i think i think ultimately you have to understand exactly what the scheme means in order to be able to represent it to your board and to change anything else that they're currently doing We've got um, two questions at the back on the left, but just while you're heading down there, if it's okay, can I just build on that very slightly and say that the banks had that very ch the banks had the same choice. So banks typically have charitable foundations that they can give money to. Um, Lloyd's is our biggest participant. It's not a secret because it's in our report and accounts. Um, they have a very very active and large charitable foundation, which they still support, but they are part of the scheme as well. And the reason they're part of the scheme is because it's a national scheme. So it has a huge sort of national impact. So the money they give to us can sort of gather together with everybody else's and it can ha it scale really helps. And of course, the other issue is the fact that we do put people back in funds. So that the two big drivers, I sound like I'm in sales mode, apologies, but the two big drivers for joining the scheme are one, that you can give us the asset and you can extinguish the liability, but you get the asset back at any point. And the second is that you're part of a, a government-sponsored a line scheme that does great things at scale. So those are the, the reasons. But charitable foundations exist and share forfeiture, I'm sure, will carry on. Sorry, at the back, we had, I think we had a couple of questions at the, at the back. We've probably got one or two more, Steve, I think. Really qu so. Very quick one. Um, in terms of engaging with proxy agencies, given that you're going to have to change your articles, is that something that you've thought of? I'm assuming that they would be on side on this but I just wanted to check that that was something that had been considered. It's a good question. Um, I think what we're talking about here is uh, if you need an article change, often yeah. you want to get support for that article change, and therefore you might be looking at um, proxy solicitation to ensure that you can get that message out to the individuals. Again, it's part of the, the, the cost of, of, of entry, so to speak. Um, there's a number of things that you would have to do, and, and these are really good points that you would have to understand before you made that recommendation to your board um, for participation. So lots of our PLC clients use a corporate sponsored nominee arrangement for their retail shareholders to hold their assets. So they're regulated by the FCA and under CAS, under the CAS framework, it would be well impossible for those to join the uh, the Reclaim Fund or indeed to forfeit assets for their own good causes. Are those types of vehicles on the radar? Do you plan to speak to the, the FCA? I'll be very quick because we are being told this has to be the, the last question, but we will be around for, for questions after this. Um, it's another great question. We have been involved and uh, the FCA are part of the expansion board. We've been talking to them a lot about the potential scope of the assets. Currently, um, nominee vehicles are out of scope. Um, so will they potentially be in scope in the future? They may well be. Um, but for now, for this current, um, this current expansion into this, into this sector, no, they're not. And I'll give two seconds on the fact that in another sector, investments and wealth management, there are some CAS rule implications. And the FCA are consulting with that sector on CAS rule changes. So there's an appetite for rule change. As Steve said, it's a bit further down the track for this sector. But the FCA will, will, won't stand in the way of rule change to enable the scheme to take place, as long as, of course, it's well considered and consulted on. OK, well, thank you very much um, for your participation, for listening in. Thank you also to Adrian and to Helen for that fantastic presentation. 
Um, and we will be around. We can talk to you about this if you want to um, over drinks. Great. Thank you.